Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we're going to begin talking about chapters 14 and 15. Chapter 14 is about acids and bases and the definitions, and chapter 15 is concerned with measuring um, the amounts of acids and base using a process called titration and the concept of pH. So let's begin with some properties of acids and bases. So what do you know about acids and bases? What are some common acids that you might know of? What are some common bases that you can name? Where is it common to hear people talk about pH balanced materials? So let's start. Historically, acids and bases are classified by their observable properties. So in general, acids were considered to be things that have a sour taste, like lemons or sour candy. They are known to corrode metals, and people learned, I guess fairly early on, that it's a bad idea to store vinegar or fruit juice in a metal container because it eats it. Um, and they also were observed to change blue litmus dye to red, blue to red. And bases, in general, are bitter in taste. They're slippery in feel. So think, if you ever um, touched bleach by accident, it's super slippery because it's a super strong base. And soaps, in general, also slippery in feel and bitter in taste. And they were uh, observed to change red litmus dye to blue. So some acidic foods that you might think of are uh, these are these gummy sour things. I don't know what you call them. All of these various sour candies. And then here's a nice chart that shows citrus fruits. Um, you know, your basic oranges and tangerines and grapefruits and lemons and limes. And I think these are kumquats. Anywho, those are some examples of some acidic foods. So let's review <clears throat> how we go about naming acids. So we learned a while ago that binary acids contain hydrogen and one other element. Remember, binary compounds only contain two elements. So in the case of binary acids, they contain hydrogen and one other element. <coughs> we use the naming convention hydroblank acid, where the blank part comes from the stem word for the anion. And examples here would be HCl hydrochloric acid. So this would be hydrogen with the chloride ion. <clears throat> here, hydrogen with the sulfide ion. So hydrosulfuric or hydrosulfuric acid. So we also had a little chart that we used, remembering that when you're naming acids, it's dependent upon the anion. If the anion ends in ide, it's a binary acid. And again, we use this hydroblankic, where the blank part comes from the stem word for the anion element. And then we learned that for ternary acids, the anion either ends in ate or ite. And if the anion ends in ate, we form the ic acid, and ite forms the us acid. And we had a saying to remind us how we name the eight and the eight acids. So an easy way to remember goes something like this. In the cafeteria, you ate something icky or you bite something delicious. So we had a flow chart. And again, here, acids, you'll know from the formula because their um, formula starts with an H, the hydrogen ion. If there are only two elements present, binary compound, then we name it hydroblankic acid. If there are three elements, you do not use the hydro prefix, and then you look at the anion. If the anion ends in eight, it becomes the ic acid, so sulfate becomes sulfuric acid. And if it ends in ite, Sulfite ion becomes sulfurous acid. Again, no hydro prefix. <clears throat> so going through some names, HBr, binary, bromide ion, hydrobromic acid, hydroblankic, 
carbonate anion, carbonic acid, eight goes to ic. Uh, this is the sulfite anion, so sulfur us, it goes to us. So that leads us to the acid base definitions, and there are three basic definitions that we use <clears throat> for acids and bases. And they start with a very narrow definition, and it goes to a broader and then the broadest definition. So this is acid and base definitions, part one. So we're going to start with the first definition, which is the Arrhenius definition. And according to that definition, um, again, let me backtrack. Uh, Arrhenius did experiments with electrolytes and aqueous solutions, and he noticed that with um, acids and bases, their solutions conducted electricity, meaning that there were electrolytes present. Therefore, the compounds were forming positive negative ions in the solution. And so he based his definition of acids and bases off of this concept that they were conducting electricity because ions were being released in water. So according to the Arrhenius model, acids are compounds that release or produce hydrogen ions in solution, H plus being the hydrogen ion. <clears throat> and the example, HCl, when it's uh, solid and put into water, you get H plus, excuse me, it's a gas. Sorry about that. Uh, HCl is a gas. If you bubble it through water, it produces an acidic solution. It releases H plus and Cl minus. And according to the Arrhenius model for bases, uh, a base is something whose aqueous solution has hydroxide ions. So bases release or produce hydroxide ions in water, aqueous solution. An example would be sodium hydroxide, which is a solid at room temperature. When you dissolve sodium hydroxide in water, you get a basic solution you're getting the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion produced. Again, they are dissociating in water. So <clears throat> this model explains how acids and bases can neutralize one another. So you'll recall uh, when we were doing um, double replacement reactions, we said the special reaction between an acid and a base when you broke it down to the net ionic equation, the net ionic equation for um, the reaction of a strong acid with a strong base was H plus plus OH minus produces water. So Arrhenius figured this out, and in 1903, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And he insisted that H plus aqueous and OH minus aqueous were important indicators in acid and base behavior, or important substances, I should say, in explaining the behavior of acids and bases. <clears throat> so some fundamental problems with this particular model. First off, that the H plus ion is essentially a bare proton, because remember, hydrogen only has one electron, one proton, and no neutrons. So when you lose an electron as a hydrogen ion, all that's left is a bare proton. And if you remember, the size of a proton is incredibly tiny. So it is hard to believe that a bare proton is actually existing in an aqueous solution. Therefore, uh, most people agreed that it is very unlikely that H plus ions will exist as free ions in aqueous solutions. What actually happens is it ends up attaching to a water molecule. So instead, these H plus ions don't really exist by themselves. They exist with surrounding water molecules. And it results in the hydronium ion, which is H3O plus aqueous. And that's what we call them today, the hydronium ion. So the hydronium ion is the result of an H plus being produced by an acid combining with water and forming this positive ion, H3O+. And again, we can also refer to it as hydrated H+, or protonated water, however you want to call it. 
So <clears throat> some other fundamental problems with the Arrhenius model of acids and bases. Many ionic compounds, salts, have basic properties and they have the ability to neutralize acids. So the Arrhenius model assumed that all bases contain the hydroxide ion and they don't. And some examples would be metal oxides and carbonates, fluorides and ammonia. So before we move on with this concept, let's discuss what we mean by strong and weak acids and bases. So by definition, with strong acid or base, it is a strong electrolyte and it is completely ionized or dissociated in water. So in contrast, a weak acid or base is a weaker electrolyte and only partially ionizes in water. So the extent to which it ionizes is usually given as a percent. So <clears throat> if we talk about a strong acid or base being 100% dissociated in water, a weak one might only be 25% or 70% ionized in water. And again, that is how <clears throat> we classify whether something is a strong acid base or a weak acid base. So strong acids, again, when we think about um, HCl, uh, hydrochloric acid, when hydrogen chloride gas is bubbled into water, we get hydrochloric acid, and what we see is chloride ions and hydronium ions. And at a molecular level, this would be your hydrogen chloride gas, and then putting it in water, you see we get chloride ions and hydronium ions. So some examples of strong acids, hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, uh, which is stomach acid and is also used in pools, hydrobromic acid, and sulfuric acid, uh, which is car battery acid and one of the components of acid rain. And there is a picture of hydrogen chloride or if it's aqueous, hydrochloric acid. And then we talk about strong bases, uh, they completely ionize in water. Most of the common strong bases are the ionic hydroxides from the group one and two metals, and they completely dissociate in water to form hydroxide ion and the cation that it was bonded to. And I had to throw in a base here because my husband plays base, so why not? So again, examples of strong bases would be sodium hydroxide, and, oops, sorry, and when we take our solid sodium hydroxide and put it in water, we get complete dissociation so that you can see we get aqueous sodium ions and aqueous hydroxide ions. Some examples, sodium hydroxide, which is what's used in drain cleaners, potassium hydroxide, and magnesium hydroxide, that's what's actually uh, the active ingredient in most antacids. And then when we think of weak acids, some examples would be acetic acid, um, which is vinegar, and it's not 100% associated, carbonic acid, which is present in soda and blood, and citric acid, which is in fruit and soda. And weak bases, examples would be ammonia, which is used in like your Windex glass cleaner, calcium carbonate, again, in antacids and minerals, and calcium hypochlorite, which is in swimming pools. So that is the end of part one of our acid and base definitions. This is Ms. Augustine signing off for now.